First of all, I would like to say thank you for accepting my paper at this conference. Uh, I'm very honored to be in such fine company of Picasso experts. I am not really an expert on Picasso. What I look at is other artists and critics' interest in Picasso. My specialty lies in 20th century Danish art. Uh, and in my paper today, I'll discuss examples of Picasso's identity seen by Danish eyes and minds in relation to local cultural debates on modernism and humanism on the Danish art scene. I'm looking at the Danish art scene after the Second World War. Picasso had an interesting reception in the first half of the century too, especially in relationship to a variety of Danish cubist expressions. For this paper, however, I am focusing on the post-war years, where Picasso was a renowned as a great master artist throughout Europe and where his importance was one of dual measures. Firstly, his artistic impact as a prime contributor to modernism, and secondly, his personal resistance to the German occupation in France and his affiliation with communism. Both of these aspects had an impact on his reception in Denmark, where the painting Guernica was widely reproduced and discussed, uh, as was his artistic contribution to the early peace movements and their Danish branches. The paper I present today reflects the work still in progress, and I will welcome constructive feedback. Behind my case study of Picasso and Denmark's lies interest in how we might rethink the relationship between national and international art histories to achieve fuller understandings of how they inform each other. Picasso belongs to international art history, although he also has his own national art history. Or, as it was interestingly discussed yesterday, he has several national art histories. However, for my argument, I am interested in his role as a modernist master artist, both in art and person, and how this translates into the Danish art world. This is why I am interested in what I term Picasso's Danish identity. How Picasso was regarded through the eyes of minds of Danish artists, critics, and politicians is traditionally categorized as reception studies, but I hesitate to use this term, as it connotes a passive one-way relationship and enforces a center-periphery thinking, which I do not subscribe to. I regard the relationship between Picasso and the Danish art scene as a dynamic relationship, where Picasso's identities and his art is a part of the aesthetic discourses on the Danish art scene. Inspiration, direct inspiration, can surely be found and is part of this discursive landscape. But uh, I focus today on active engagement with Picasso, both in person and in artworks, rather than on solely tracking his aesthetic influence. Uh, the relationship of Picasso to Denmark is not just one of distance and closeness, but one of time too. When and where does Picasso enter into Danish art history? He is not a Danish artist. He did not, to my knowledge, visit Denmark, nor do we have more than a handful of his paintings and a collection of graphic sheets in Danish museum collections today, most of which have entered the collection from the 1970s and later. Um, uh, sorry, Chronologi chronologically we can track his influence, but I'm interested also in the anachronic meanings rising from his art, and in this regard I'm thinking of Guernica. There are multiple examples of how Guernica was a point of reference when discussing the state of international affairs and the sociocultural mentality. The cultural crisis felt in Denmark after two world wars, wars meant a disillusionment with humanistic values and human enlightenment, which had so thoroughly failed but it also meant a need and drive towards restoration, rebuilding, and an optimistic faith in modern man's and modern technology's potential toward creating a better future. And Guernica was used as an example of both. Uh, Content-wise, it manifests the failings of modernity, but formally it marks a triumph as it grasps the devastation of war and civil laws, not just the cold facts, but the terror of the situation. In this act of communication, it manifests a potential for affective connectivity that brings a sort of hope in itself. One example of this is the Danish artist and critic Helge Ernst. Ernst has repeatedly expressed admiration for Picasso 
and has lectured as well as written a book about him. He regarded Guernica as a modernist masterpiece on formal terms, but importantly, along with other critics, regarded the painting central in expressing a cultural crisis after the Second World War. In Denmark, the belief in humanistic values was shaken, and to Ernst, Ernst Guernica both expressed it and in part redeemed it, as proof that art could grasp life and make people see the truth. On November 3rd in 1951, in the left-wing paper Information, Information, he wrote, quote, You often pit Matisse up against Picasso, and of course he is a great painter. But Picasso is our own time. Guernica is not only the Spanish Civil War, it is also two world wars and our whole situation today, unquote. This type of statement is not unique. Guernica featured in the Danish art world in other ways, not least in reproduction. I have few comments yet uh, to this part of Guernica's presence in Denmark, but I do want to mention it, as it seems to me an issue hard to analyze, but also a very pervasive presence materially, and hence mentally and culturally. Along with other masterpieces of Western art, Guernica was, was reproduced as poster. The most well-known Danish printing press was Minerva Prints, uh, and prints could be purchased by mail order or at Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. Louisiana was a private museum of modern art which opened in 1958 and quickly set the agenda for the part of the Danish public interested in art and culture. The purchasing, purchasing of artworks in reproduction can be regarded as either consumerist or intellectually significant. I'm inclined to place significance on the circulation of artworks in reproduction and think that although it is relevant and interesting that Guernica was exhibited in Copenhagen in 1938, the presence of the painting via reproduction has a more pervasive influence on Danish cultural life. That it was on the minds of many and was a matrix to think through is evidenced by the choice to reprint the essay of a high school student in the journal published by Luciana Museum of Modern Art in the November issue of 1960. Not a notable professor, but a high school student. Perhaps later he was notable, but here presented as simply a youth yet touched by the painting. These examples point to Guernica as a work with great actuality and relevance in post-war Denmark. It pops up in Danish cultural life as part of a frame of reference when expressing views on current cultural situations and cultural values. This reception is likely not unique to Denmark, but it is significant, and I do think we can claim to understand, um, or I do not think <laughs> we can claim to understand what goes on in Dan Danish art and cultural life without including non-Danish works of art such as Picasso's Guernica into the discourse, even if some types of presence, such as the choice to purchase a poster, it is hard to analyze with any certainty. One example that can be analyzed is a very explicit engagement with Guernica. In 1950, the above-mentioned artist and critic Helge Ernst made an experimental film titled Guernica and Image Fantasy in Bill Fantasy. This six minutes long short film was never screened in Denmark and little is known about it, but apparently it received a prize at a film festival in Venice and apparently Picasso saw it and he liked it. Ernst uh, went on to make educational and documentary television and films about art and culture. He lectured and wrote about art as well as worked as an artist himself. He moved from naturalism in the late 1930s to geometric abstraction in the 1950s. He is considered a minor artist in Denmark and hardly anything has been written about him so far. One of the reasons for this is I think that his most interesting contribution to Danish art lies in the intermedial and transdisciplinary contributions he makes to the art world and this only becomes visible when the methodological understanding of what constitutes art history is broadened to encompass areas such as intellectual history. But let's get back to his film on Guernica. Ernst's film is a three-dimensional animation of elements of Picasso's painting, and it combines documentary footage from the bombing, bombing of Guernica Village, a reproduction of, of Picasso's Guernica, and Ernst's own theatrical and sculptural animations of Picasso's painting. The film starts with footage from the bombing of Guernica and progresses to show a reproduction of Picasso's painting going up in smoke. Only this is shown in reverse. 
So the painting literally and metaphorically comes into being out of the flames and ashes of Guernica, the village. The message is clear. Both modern art and cultural crisis arises out of the ashes and comes into being. But both the modernist masterpiece and the modernist critique comes into being here. The movie continues with scenes that reenact the painting. The painting is brought to life first in three-dimensional sculpture, moved and turned across the screen, and later intercut with the head of a woman expressing the emotional content of Guernica through human gesture. So the screaming mother and the fallen soldier in Picasso's painting is thus mimicked by the woman and by a sculptural model of the head of the fallen soldier flying through the air. In another shot, human arms hold on to uh, arms from the painting. And on top of this interaction, uh, Picasso's wheel from an earlier stage of the painting spins like crazy. In the end, the models crumble. The woman looked, looks at us through a mask. Then the mask is shown empty, and in the end, it breaks too. Ernst's film seems to me unreconciled. With the migration of suffering and affect from painting to animation and then to the woman, suggests to me that art carries a message from human being to human being, or that that is Ernst's message here. From representation, it becomes real and re-experienced through reenactment by the woman. The student essay I mentioned above starts with the following word. Quote, can a painting speak? Can a piece of painted canvas scream? Picasso's large painting Guernica can, unquote. So there's a similarity in reception here. Here the woman screams silently to us, emphasizing the Guernica. Thus art stands as an intermediator between people, bringing them together. On the other hand, the broken and empty mask suggests that the human being and humanism has departed. And only rubble is left of both artistic ideals in the world. Both are sides of the late experience of modernity, and it makes sense that both, although contradictory, are part of Ernst's personal vision of Picasso's painting. The painting as mediator becomes part redeemer of the devastating message it conveys. In the aftermath of the Second World War, pessimism and optimism goes hand in hand. Never again is a commonly used rhetoric. With the on-march of the Cold War, this becomes even more pressing. While there is doubt and hesitation in parts of the art world toward statistic representation, and here I'm thinking in broad terms of Adorno's statement that there can be no art after Auschwitz, there is an optimism and will to reconstruction through artistic, political, and social means um, among the Danish left-wing artists and thinkers. Guernica is on their mind too. But their focus is on creating a better future rather than on modernist self-critique. For the last part of my paper, I want to show you two examples of appropriation of Picasso's art for the partisans of peace. So where Ernst's film is essentially a modernist aesthetic engagement, the appropriation of Picasso's peaceworks and their aesthetics is in a gray zone between fine arts and visual culture. And they draw their strengths from this double affiliation. Picasso, as you know, made a number of works for the left-wing peace movement, movement Partisans of Peace, starting with the Peace Dove in 1949. A great number of doves and related figurative, often folkloristic images followed on from this. His role as celebrity ambassador for the movement was important, and the use of his images in a Danish context bore witness to it, such as the reproduction of the image from this poster on the back of the left-wing journal Dialog, which means dialogue, um, which you see here. By reproducing Picasso's work, Danish left-wing artists and intellectuals manifested their international connection with Picasso and with communists everywhere. Through their shared involvement with the peace movement, they could seem to have a special claim to Picasso uh, and his works. But the connection went beyond reproducing the works. His status as a modernist master was again important because it lent status to the peace movements but content and aesthetics was equally important. Similarly to Ernst Guernica, emphasis was on solidarity, communication, and touch. A figurative style was favored, often simple, heavy figures with folkloristic, sometimes rustic elements.
Danish left-wing graphic artist Per Ulrich was on the editorial board of DLO from 1952 onwards and specifically edited the visual side of the journal. He made this cover for DLO, uh, and the rural motif is inspired by modern Mexican print culture, uh, but the composition of a man and a woman facing each other, connecting, connecting also references Picasso's poster. The hands touching, half in worship, half as a protective gentle gesture in both works, connotes a philosophy of physical labor, skills, and again, touch. And on solidarity and through touch, empathy between people. Ulrich also made the sketch for a Christmas card for the Danish branch of Partisans of Peace in Denmark called Fredens Tilhinger. Here he paraphrases Picasso so closely that it borders on copying. You could regard this as uninventive or even as fraud. But together with the image below, I think the top paraphrase of Picasso's dove tells us about a feeling of shared ownership of the piece dove, iconography, and style. A visual culture set in motion by Picasso, but belonging to the peace partisans, including Picasso. A visual culture where reference to Picasso, and perhaps deference, was important, but where the life of the image belonged to and relied on the activists. The leader of the Danish Partisans of Peace was a doctor, resistance fighter, and communist politi politician, Mons Fo. He wrote in Dialog, uh, the journal, among other places as well, as was a national and international spokesperson for the Danish Peace Partisans. Here he is in a photograph from a peace rally in Copenhagen in 1956. Um, significantly, this peace rally was held on the Danish Liberation Day for the Second World War, May 5th. Um, and behind him is a presumably Danish work featuring a mother and child in the manner of the return to order, imminent not just in Picasso's interwar years, but also in the peace works. Congruent with Picasso's peace art, the drawing is simple and on a plain white background. With little narration nor visual cues, the motif becomes open to a wide range of people, groups, and nationality. An overlooked, I think, but very important feature in this peace art aesthetics. And I look at this um, banner, I look in comparison to this, images like this, and this banner with the, with the face and the dove and the olive branch. And here we are in Denmark. Some specificity, specificity is at work in the banner. Behind Mons Fo, the olive branch uh, and the dove has been replaced by a twig of beech leaves, a national symbol of Denmark associated with youth and spring. In my opinion, the banner behind Faux partakes in the visual culture around the peace movement internationally. Here the original image migrate and involve with the context. Here a national symbol is featured, creating a specificity as that does the date of the event itself to Danes, but at the same time globality and universality are present with a non-specific general motif of mother and child, which aims to speak across borders and thus connect the people at this specific rally on May 5th, 1956, with like-minded people all over the world. In 1982, the Danish communist newspaper Land of Folk, meaning Land and People, published a collection of Picasso's peace works. Each image printed individually on white paper in the manner of fine art prints, thus evoking the celebrated modernist fine art Picasso. However, the red cover lays claim to both a modernist Picasso and a political activist Picasso. The title on the cover reads P Pablo Picasso, Peace Fighter and Communist. It does not read artist. Here again, the left-wing movement in Denmark evokes the modernist Picasso via the prints inside this, uh, but as a part of the political Picasso. They try to give shape and identity to their own ideals and visions by claiming Picasso as part of their identity and in turn Picasso as somehow present in part in Danish left-wing culture and politics. To conclude, with another cover of Dialog, the journal. The doves and journal cover by Per Ulrich, this cover, the beach twig, and Ernst's experimental movie, movie manifest the success of Picasso precisely because they are not Picasso. They are Picasso in Denmark, in an applied context. Um, through works of Picasso, Danish artists and critics responded not just to Picasso, but to the state of affairs in the world, 
to the challenges posed by the experience of modernity in general and to the rise of the Cold War specifically. The real life of the dove, the success of the image, is, in my opinion, in, in its appropriation by others. Thank you. Thank you.